and welcome to Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm Nicole. I'm Tori. And I'm Josh. Uh, Jesse and Tori, uh, welcome back to our panel. And Nicole, welcome, welcome back to our panel. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Nicole was on uh, season one and season four. Uh, amazing to have you on our panel. Thank uh, you. I keep leaving, coming back. California and coming back. <laughs> You're gonna be going to North Carolina too. Yeah, North Carolina. Because you just picked up the position uh, teaching literature. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's fun. We wanted to uh, we wanted to go somewhere where there's uh, less people and more cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, North Carolina <laughs> cows. Just go to West Jersey. Yeah. West Jersey's West just <laughs> as expensive as regular Jersey. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to really get into because there's there's a reason why New Jersey's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be going over a really interesting uh, work of literature today. Uh, it is uh, current, uh, but it is amazing, and that is uh, *The Martian* by Andy Weir. Uh, this is a copy that I got from my sister for my birthday, uh, which features Matt Damon from the film adaptation. And Jesse, uh, for the very first time, is going to be providing us with the discussion starter. Yes, I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have um, a little bit of a like, kind of prep talk before I actually ask the dis uh, discussion question. So be prepared, guys. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm actually I'm referring to, to um, in the library or in this copy of the book, page uh, 89, uh, the CNN News show, uh, the Mark Watney Report. <clears throat> Um, they interview NASA's uh, flight psychologist, Dr. Irene Shields. Um, she talks about how it's important for astronauts um, to not only be chosen for their skills and intelligence, but also for their personalities. And this ensures that they will not only work well together, but will ultimately get along on a personal level, level outside of work. Mark is described by Irene as very intelligent, um, particularly resourceful, and a good problem solver, which we see throughout the book, how that helps him. I think those are the nice things. Yes. Or the, the more professional. <laughs> yes. Accurate. Yes. Very, yeah. Yeah, she had to say pretty professional with that. But she does follow with um, how he's a good natured man, usually cheerful, with a great sense of humor, and he's quick to crack a joke. So, my question for the panel is Do you feel that those last three qualities made a difference in Mark's survival alone on Mars? Oh, Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. If he had no sense of humor, he wouldn't have been able to. Like, I, I know being a problem solver is the technical thing that got him through those struggles, but being able to stay optimistic and positive and find the humor in a situation that was as bleak as it can get you know, sustained him on an emotional level. That's and actually a, a survivalistic trait is um, being able to find comedy. They actually, a couple years ago, they did, a, I mean, so, comedy is not something that is, it's very subjective and it's very hard to pinpoint what you find amusing. But they said like in general, if you look at it, the brain shifts into a whole other pattern of thought that gets overlaid on top of the main thought process. There's a term for it, and I apologize, I don't remember the term for it at this point in time, but um, it's basically like puns, whenever you see a pun or something like that, where it's like, two fish in a tank um, look to, uh, talk to each other. One says, you grab the steering wheel, and I'll like take the, I, I'm, I botched it, but like tank, the, the play on word is yeah. tank, you know, a big mm -hmm. tank versus like a fish tank. Mm -hmm. But like that kind of stuff, that thought process is actually, they said, um, the ability to, uh, sur like, it's a survival instinct, being able to say, oh, there's something here that's wrong. So being able to, instead of, like, jumping at it, understanding that instead of, oh, it's a problem and, like, panicking, it's more along the lines of, I can deal with this, and using it as a coping mechanism. Right, so, making life so, And I think yeah, it kind of, like, it. shows his optimism, too, because I feel like even though so many things went wrong and everything was against him, he still was like, oh, well, of course that would happen, but maybe Mars Lewis is trying to kill yeah, me. Mars, <laughs> maybe Lewis's disco can help me, and he just puts it on and goes to work and fixes the problem. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about this book is how optimistic and lighthearted it is. It's a very fatalistic thought pro Like, it's a very dire situation that he's in, quite literally dire. And the fact that he's able to make all these jokes and, like, 
at one point in time he lists um, a unit of measurement and is like it's so really hard to like, comprehend. He calls it like a pirate ninja. That was he calls great. himself like a space pirate at some point. There's this small postulation little of like on the politics. Prairie was my favorite. Yeah, little yeah, have on, on the prairie. So like that Actually, kind of stuff. One of my um, favorite comedic reliefs was uh, where they're talking about he's alone on an entire planet. What could he possibly be thinking? And he's like. How can Aquaman control whales? Yes. They're mammals. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And you're like, that's what doesn't make sense to you. The, the book reads according like, to the general population. Uh, the general population wants to think where they feel that he's thinking about survival, 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 and that means technicality is the specific. How how am I going to get food? Uh, Which he is, but he also needs. You know, you will literally like a mind brain. Is yeah. a huge part of uh, what makes us human and what keeps us sane. And that's another part of the, the lighthearted, like, comedic um, ability of his is to be able to entertain himself. Because if you are literally isolated for so long, your brain is going to, like, start picking up on things. And either it's going to go, like, absolutely bonkers out of its own mind trying to find sources of stimuli. And actually, or it's going to yeah, and I know I mentioned uh, off-camera um, before that I had done a little bit of background research. I read an article on uh, BBC.com. Um, that was basically a nice compilation of the different um, experiments and you know different people who've uh, lived through um, social isolation and when they took volunteers and isolated them in just solitary confinement with no sort of stimulation um, college student volunteers they couldn't last more than two to five days um, yeah I would go absolutely crazy so the fact that they lasted that long well, that's yeah. probably one of the very first tests that they uh, engaged yeah. in I yeah. think one of the huge parts of that for me was going back to like the entertainment the ability to keep his mind occupied aside from obviously the life or death tasks he had you said, you know, you mentioned Lewis's disco. Like, everything he had there, the disco music, the TV programs that were picked out, books. He none wishes of books. he didn't have the disco music. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but none of it was chosen by him. It was all chosen by his crewmates. So I think that was a really strong mm. allusion to his ability to keep a, con a human connection mm. even yes. when there was none. He was keeping this human connection to his crewmates, the people that he had despite trained the, with. Despite Just, the fact that it was cynical. Despite the cynic and the isolation, yeah, he mm -hmm. was you know, clinging to those bonds in a subconscious way. And even so much as doing those logs, the daily logs, is talking to someone, and he even postulates it. He's like, I may be dead when you read this, so it's kind of a conversation, but it's a little one-sided at this point. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Uh, so he is able to ground himself in the thought process of, and ultimately this is the reason why there's such a mad dash like no matter the cost to try and rescue him is he's trying to find a way to survive right. and uh, his, re his report though the mark report was so Truman-esque oh. and I was <laughs> the, when it first started I was like it's the Truman show it's the Truman show <laughs> and I was like but Truman left eventually so mm -hmm. I was like maybe this is like another kind of allusion to the outcome of the book and I spoiled it for myself because I had seen the movie before I read the book but, mm -hmm. so, but that not, does not always mean movie. that it's the same as I we know. I actually did find time to watch the movie again like halfway through the book I was doing laundry and stuff so I just threw it on because mm -hmm. it was on, on demand um, and watching it now after reading the book I'm like there are so many technical things that would have you know, like that I felt need to stand out. Like, yes, a movie is for entertainment, but at the same time, it's like there were so many things that he did to survive right. that, and that you could learn a lot to, from. Yeah, it goes back to the incorporation of how, how solid this book was grounded in its mathematical and its scientific background. And yeah, Andy Weir has, uh, that's his area of expertise, so he was the right show. person mm -hmm. to put this together. Yeah, wasn't this Plus, just one of those like thought process, like what yeah. if sort of situations, and then he mm -hmm. just created an entire storyline out of that which is fan, what like, I mean, he, he was definitely you know the best person like you said to put this together I think a big part of it for me when I was reading the with the technical aspects and everything I like imagining the author's process and I'm, I'm just seeing him sitting there with like his plot map which was <laughs> not a normal plot yeah, yeah like, race like what else well, I mean, can we throw it this guy? Andy Weir, do, he was so. what he, according to the back of this biography, he is uh, he was first hired as a programmer for a national laboratory at the age of fifteen. Yo. 
and he's a lifelong Smart. space nerd <laughs> and a devoted hobbyist of subjects such as relativistic physics, orbital mechanics, and the history of manned spaceflight. And you can Sorry, tell. This is weird. Huh? Is there a Mrs. Weir? Anybody with about? all those hobbies? Is he still on the market? Because what was interesting was uh, how Andy Weir, the way that he described Mars, uh, he didn't he didn't do anything that was that made it too fantastical. He just used what he felt was as factual as one could. I was just about to say, well, make. Mars is really not that Yeah, they describe it as a wasteland. Yeah. Which so essentially is what it's it oxidizing. Is. It's so old, yeah. it's oxidizing, which I it would it, which is true. That's why it's the color that it is, is you it's it's degrading and that's why it's so dusty and stuff like that. Because it once was, I think they said similar to like Earth in that it had water and it had an atmosphere, and now it's very, very different. That's what I like. I liked how Andy Weir decided to take a more realistic direction as opposed to incorporate a Martian colony and turn it into more of a fantasy leaning. Right, and that's what I was thinking about when I was reading this too, because I was reading it and part of me was thinking, is it dystopian literature? Like, is it a what if? Or is it realistic fiction? Is it a is it it's definitely realistic it something fiction. that could happen? And I was like going back and forth because obviously dystopian literature has the whole political aspects that this didn't have. But then when they started rallying to save him, and I was like, mm. but I really think like the realistic fiction from feeding off of the accuracy of everything in the book. Oh, sorry, I, know. I, I would definitely say it's not dystopian. Like I said, because of how hopeful it is. Right. Because of how like usually dystopian. Yes, there are all these things and like. Everything goes wrong, but yeah. it's like almost like a black hole of wrongness. Absolutely, not... people are like, uh, to me, whenever I think of dystopian like literature, it's there's kind of almost this bleak aspect to it of and, and more fake, more like, like, like with the Hunger Games or with um, what you know different. I, I don't know about th to me. This is my interpretation of of what I've read in that genre. Is it's not so much um, fake as in there's this kind of almost feeling of like an uphill battle yeah. for this. There, there was a plausibility because he was so mathematically minded, but had that charismatic, right. it was like you know, a very duality. small light at the end of the tunnel, but it was there. It he was able to, you know, say like, I'd this say is where I want to go, and that's where I want to go. It's realistic science fiction, but it's only fiction in the nature that the characters are from the writer's Absolutely. imagination. Right. Yeah, that's a good way of saying yeah, it. That, yeah, I agree. Speaking of, of from the imagination, from a, an individual who has such a science strong background, mm -hmm. he wrote a visually entertaining novel. Like it felt like I was reading the script of a movie, and the way that he interspersed, like, got very creative. He could have just had it linearly, where it was the entire law the mm -hmm. entire time, and that's what I was anticipating to happen. That's but then it cuts. His characters are fantastic. They're so well fleshed Dynamic, out. Yeah. yeah. The thing that I want to say really? about the characters too that I thought about, I felt like every character he had reacted the way I would imagine actual people yeah, in that they, they, they felt like they lived in react. Um, there was I couldn't stand Annie Montrose. Oh, God, no. You're not supposed to. Every other thing she <laughs> said was the first one. Like the PR yeah. person. <laughs> See, I think that part of me was really waiting for, like, not that I don't believe that like the people chosen for NASA are the best for the job, but like part of me wanted to be like, are you gonna have a mental breakdown now? Like where is it? Like, you're stuck on Mars. You're stuck on Mars. And that give me like a little more panic. And he did. He was like a rock. And if anything, because I read it as so realistic, it reinstilled my faith in like the NASA programs and the people that were entrusting with these types of there's, missions. There's a reason they are where they are. There's a reason they're there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and they are I think the other thing too about how he he does it in like the logs and stuff. I I think it's not really meant to show you his breakdowns because I mean, is he really gonna get on his video log and just totally lose it? No, he's gonna. Yeah. His log is meant to be there, so you know, if he has to, he can go back where he worked out his problems. Yeah. I, he does admit to saying that he cried when he finally made contact with NASA. Yeah, he mm -hmm. does admit to that, but. He has to remember. And it's so I'm an human. I mean, so it's human. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Well, there's this, it's called, I think, the rubber duck theory or something to that effect. Programmers, whenever they're, they'll have like an object on their desk. And I think even Google in the like starter kit, whenever you're introduced to the uh, yes, company, has to have Google. something to make you smile. It's like, oh. well, no, 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 no. It's an object, very much so like how he documents, you know, this is what I'm doing and how he spells out on the map. 
it's something for you to be able to, you know, like when you walk into a room, you have, you're like, so, okay, hear me out here and have an entire conversation with somebody, but they never respond. You're like, oh, good, thank you. And then you walk away. That's what the rubber duck theory is. Right. The rubber duck oh, okay. concept is here's an object that I can talk to that I won't feel like, and there are people, oh, like, there are I documentations get, get right, of people was... being like, yes, this, this object has no sentience, right. but then like other people will like take other ducks and be like, have a chorus and have like a council of these objects. So that way you feel like, okay, well, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. Humans have the ability to imprint on anything and everything. And even so much as like a variance for his Again, like, connecting, connecting to that. It's like George Carlin. Uh, Charlie's going to love this analogy that uh, when he took on uh, narrating for Thomas the Tank Engine, he, uh, he, need, he needed to have a, uh, a teddy bear in the room to look at while he was narrating because otherwise he wouldn't be able to uh, meld into uh, right. you need that that humanity hand. you need mm -hmm. something to give and even if it's like a, a nondescript object like a can of soda yeah. but like you need something to be able to talk at at the very least right. for you that's to be able to raise and that's what, and that's what they that say that, that that's kind of like a proof of uh, you know like intelligence too Absolutely. Yeah. you know Absolutely. be able to talk to something and so you can talk something out talking out loud to yourself things like that I to feel when I teach out. I'm just talking out loud to myself <laughs> Something a chorus of fifth graders staring at me. The one and other no one was no. the one other part that I wanted to kind of ask you guys about, and it was I think it was the only part to me that kind of actually got me a little emotional um, was when uh, Johansson was talking with her father mm. before, like they as they were going around Earth, and yeah. it was that realization that if this doesn't work. I'm the one that they chose God, to love. That was that was the stuff. only part. Yeah, that was that the was only part that really actually got yeah. me. Like, what did you guys think about that? Where they collectively sat down and said, "Okay, if this doesn't work, we're going to kill ourselves, and you're going to live." I, Eat us. I think it gave, <laughs> like, I think it gave credence to the folks when they sat down and said, "Yes, this is absolutely what we're doing," because they literally did look at every worst case scenario and went to the dire, you know, apocalyptic case, you know, worst case scenario, she's stuck in a tin can um, for days and days and days. Something's going to happen. You only have a certain amount of rations. And it's I, a very human yeah. way of looking. And but she I think takes up the least ration because she's the shortest. Right. She's the yeah, lightest. The smallest. Smallest. Yeah, not yeah, not so much the shortest, but the smallest. Because that's not just based on height. That's based on body weight, right. caloric intake. Yeah. I think for me, I was thinking the whole time while that was happening, I was thinking, like, is that better or is that worse? Like, would I rather be one of the people who sacrificed myself or would I rather be the only living survivor? But it all depends on who it is. Yeah. I think a lot of them would actually have that sense of guilt. And it, yes, there's survivor's guilt, but there's also like the math. That's the unfortunate. I think that's what hit me was the fact that like that's spelling out too. like these are, these are the amount of calories that I'm going to need a day. I'm going to need like I can work on three fourths of a ration. It reminded like me stuff. too because I just went through um, the Netflix series Lost in Space. I don't know if anyone's seen it yet, but it was a reboot of the older series, and it was really great. And there's a point where they're trying to launch a ship to meet the other very Martian-esque where they're trying to launch off of this planet that's dying to meet with the mother hub and they have to strip the whole ship and do everything like old school no nav no nothing and they ask a pilot and they're like we're asking you because you're the best and she goes you're not asking me because i'm only 119 pounds and i was like or like oh, I, because yeah, that's yeah, like because like, oh, that's what they're thinking they're considering and, 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 yeah, and the woman and looked at her and goes stuff. it helps and i was like it's again it's that comedy it's that humor of being able to look at a really serious situation that may not be survived and, and find that positive I, I light. think that's why this part got me was because there was no like hearted moment in that conversation with no, her it was father. Very and serious. to think that the rest of the crew basically disconnected themselves for only numbers and basically said, because she said that Captain Lewis did it. It's like, could you imagine sitting and having this conversation with yourself saying, okay, I'm going to kill myself so you can live. Again, like, it comes again, down, and again, this is, this is the big question, and I revisited this again and again and again in the book. Was it all worth it? Was it worth it for this one? Now we're looking at a scenario where everyone is going to die I think to save this one person, including the one person that they're trying to save. It went but, from, is it worth it to, can we do it? Right. And everybody loves a challenge, and that's what it came down to is, can we do it? And how, from not a political standpoint, but from like a, a, a political standpoint, 
how are we going to show that we as Americans can do this? And then China got involved, and so China can say that. And there's a, a really great conversation between mm -hmm. that Marsh and Hong. I um, supported the decision from the start. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. But uh, from, <laughs> from a from a stamp, uh, the one Chinese official. I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name either. It's um, like you, you win. Uh, well, the 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 two, you know, the Chinese NASA versus the American mm -hmm. NASA. The two of them are talking, and they look at him and said we will never be able to do what we do did with what it was initially created for. Now it's, look what, it, yes, we'll have a Chinese uh, astronaut on the seat for like Aries 5, but we'll never be able to say, look at this beautiful creation of a beautiful probe that we created. That's like the best probe and the perfect probe to be able to send into space. That's not what's going to go down in history. This is what this is what. But I mean, in a way, you can kind of. And I did. I felt for that guy because he spent years of his yeah, life dedicated to this project, and mm -hmm. it Countless didn't happen. Yeah. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? Instead, he's going to go down in history as stepping up because nobody knew they had this technology. Absolutely. And he didn't have to help, and he did. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so what would you rather go down in history for creating this amazing probe that you know went and orbited the sun? But from a scientific or, standpoint, like that's that's important. That's brilliance. That's showing like. But from a humanistic standpoint, yeah, none of it matters if you're going to let your humanity die for science. Then Absolutely. What and that's are you how doing? I saw it. It's like more people are going to remember him and you know, congratulate him and honor him because he put aside his life and he's going to, and he's going to be able to live with himself. Like, I don't know yeah. that I could live with myself knowing that I, you know, you have a whole crew up there him. willing to kill themselves so that this man can possibly live and you won't give up your research. Like that's, you know what I mean? When you draw it all out, but again, I know it was so important to him and it was his whole life's work, but it was, it was bigger than just a probe. It was yeah. more useful we're look, than just We're looking that. at it from a non-scientific standpoint. We're looking at it from, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to argue. I'm just saying, like, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, but like if you, you put you yourself in yourself. the, the head, head space of somebody who, like, science is what they live, breathe, right. and, and, and exist for. So they don't have a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of, like, humanity sometimes from, a, from that standpoint, if you've ever interacted with these sort of folks, like, that, that doesn't necessarily matter as much as the technology. Right. So it's what they invested. That was a part exactly, of it. That, yeah. that was a part of uh, uh, that bothered me was when uh, the journalists and people that were looking to uh, make uh, create an image to the general population. Uh, uh, Mark Watney is on Mars doing what he can to survive, mm -hmm. and. They want him to pose for a picture. Yeah, I love that. And that was, he was in his space suit, and he just. Like, we want to see his space. Hey. Like, how can you see his like face? He has to survive. And this thing doesn't work that way, yeah. I mean, this this whole part kind of reminded me of, of the very, like, last paragraph, or one of the last paragraphs of the book where he says um, that everyone did it because it's basic human instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountains, people will coordinate search. If a train crashes, people will line up to give blood. If an earthquake levels a city, people all over the world will send emergency supplies. And he said, I had billions of people on my side. Because it's a sense of optimism. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, and even though the whole book was just problem after problem after problem after problem, the thing is, people really aren't as cynical as we think we are. I, I know some people who are total a-holes um, who were like but you know what Haiti happened how, how many people gave blood how many people donated their money even and their right supplies here. and their time yeah even right here when Hurricane Sandy hit it was mm -hmm. you know I went you're to so a cool. church to Just donate some back. stuff and I said we're here to help volunteer they said we're actually full of volunteers right now and I was like wow that's what we need to, yeah. we need to what, also you know, we have to look at home too because there's a lot of uh missions that take place out of country. Mm -hmm. So even though like this was in, again, fictional scenario, even though this was an expensive, you know, kind of ordeal in a way, it doesn't surprise me that see, people wanted I've, to see. I think him from my safe. perspective, it wasn't even the monetary commitment. It was the, how many lives will you trade yes. for one? Yeah. That's where it got me thinking because Again, there's the probability that everyone survives. We save this man and wonderful, but there's also a probability that to rescue one person, we sacrifice all these others. And that really kind of challenged me because 
you know, if you told me that there was a train that was heading down two different tracks and there was you know, one person standing on this track and 20 people standing on this one, but you have to make it go one direction. Isn't that a giant, instinct like, instinct is to, yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah, like, instinct is to save as more as you can, yeah. mm-hmm. but in this circumstance, it was, it was not that simple. And actually, if, not you, if you think decision, about it, you know I mean. if you think about it, that's actually what Teddy did. Um, the, the director of NASA where he said, okay, no, we're not going to tell Hermes to turn around. Right. And, it and was, then they went behind his yeah, back and they sent went, the plan. Exactly. So, I mean, because in I think a way, they that's how Hermes makes thinking. Him look bad. But yeah. then I think what Teddy didn't realize is also what I'm kind of, the situation that I'm setting in is, well, it's not our decision. It, it is. It. And I that, don't think I, it wasn't that he didn't realize it. He just, it, it was uh, way differently in yeah. his mind. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't disagree with him that, you know, risking six lives or risking one life. I did not disagree with him, but I did disagree with, and, and Mitch was right, where he said, it's not our decision to make. You know, if these people want to risk their lives to save their, you know, crewmate, then let them choose. Right. And that's where, that was the only part that I felt he was wrong. He wasn't wrong in the math. No. I'm figuring it out, no, but it was definitely wrong. I think that part. was the most aggravating aspect was every single decision was the right decision, equally the wrong decision, right. because every single outcome meant that there was going to be some amount of risk. Right. And I think they even explained it at one point. It was like risk a little versus risk a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're also weighing, and that's the reason why he didn't want to tell the crew members is because he said they're emotionally connected. They spent months of, and weeks of time with one another creating that like that bond because that bond is what was going to keep them alive right. and working and, and functioning at exactly. the highest point. And not to mention, going back to Irene, I mean, these people were based on their personalities and their skills chosen to be together because they knew psychologically they would get along. So and this connection was made so much deeper than just spending, you know, a few and years. That's, what I, I, that's what, I like, what I like about the way that this book was structured is uh, there are so many books that I read where you don't, you have to wait quite a while for anybody to even acknowledge that this person is in the position that they're in. They realized that he was, that there was something suspicious right away, Mm -hmm. which a lot of that is credited to uh, Mindy Park's uh, 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 observances of the... She was quick about it, and Mm -hmm. that's another thing why I, and as I said before, I feel like everybody in NASA reacted the way that I expected them to react, Mm -hmm. how a person in NASA... You know, they're supposed to notice little small things like Mm -hmm. that. And the fact that she did, Mm -hmm. and, you know, because of that, they were able to watch him, see what he was doing. And as soon as they realized he was going for Pathfinder, they're like, all right, Pathfinder, get it online, Mm -hmm. like, do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So that, like... Everything felt very human, very real. Very real, yeah. And made it, I think, all the more enjoyable was, Mm -hmm. yes, you had this, like, this weird, unprecedented thing that was happening. And it wasn't just he was stranded in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, it made it, it made being stranded on Mars seem problem, yeah, like, real. like problem. Yes. Like, you're like, yes. like yeah, at absolutely. first you read it, you're like, he's stranded on Mars. And then he starts going for Pathfinder. You're like, go get Pathfinder. <laughs> this makes sense. And I understand what you're doing. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. But I trust him. What's funny is because it starts off as like this giant, like two trains are in a train station at opposite ends of a town. Like it starts as one of those math questions that you get on like your SATs or something like that. And you start with like heavy math, heavy science, heavy like reasoning stuff out. And for some reason, that grounds the book even more so yes. in this alternate reality of this, mm. you know, this um, not too distant future and having it happen because he explains all the science and because science is constant or you hope it is constant, like these mathematical formula that he's throwing at you and, and the elemental, if you break it down from an, an atomic level, like that's constant. It doesn't matter what time uh, or what year you're in. like. That, until we figure that out, is, like, going to be constant. Mm-hmm. So it created this weird, like, basis and groundwork. You for had, like, a in later in realistic in one foot in reality. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so that was fun. It made him very real, mm-hmm. too. As I see it, Andy Weir is the right person to write this book. That's I don't really think they're... Yeah, if it was anybody else, it would not have worked. But because it was the, mm-hmm. the, the person who wrote it had... 
that background. Two feet, yeah. you know, one foot in in the science and the other foot in the ability to have such a beautiful imagination. And this is his first book, too. Yeah, absolutely. And that I was what I found start. so <laughs> wild. Was, this was self-published in 2011 and was very unremarkable up until 2014 when the movie. Yeah, when the rights were purchased, I think, to be a movie, and then it blew up. So it just, it, it was kind of this unremarkable book that hung around and had such a cult following that it, was able to be published. And I think what built that cult following was the fact that, because I'm not extremely smart, I'm, I'm smart, but very smart. But I'm not uh, mad, I, I'm, I not mad, I'm not completely. mad that you're not science smart. smart. Oh, you're I would have. Already, uh, uh, Nicole, uh, during your uh, hiatus from Literary Gladiators, uh, you've become very active with the animal. Uh, rescues, animals, pets, dogs? Yes, so I work with two rescues. One's called Rebecca's Rescues and one's called Four Claws, and they are both based out of New Jersey. Um, they both do cats and dogs, but Rebecca's Rescues has a, a more of a cat inventory coming in just because that's kind of where they started, so they're more established in the cat community. They're, they're kind of one of the main rescues that people call when they find ferals or strays, or you know, we just got in a litter of 11 the other day, and um, yeah, the cutest little babies in the world. Yeah, we've had a, we've had a, a, you know, it's an approximate, but I know that Rebecca have taken in um, about twenty five kittens last month oh, or wow. so. Yeah, mm -hmm. very very cool. Does love cats? A lot of cats. A lot of cats. They're beautiful and they're such sweethearts. And you know, we have challenging ones that come in and are sometimes not as friendly, and it's our job to kind of coach them back into friendliness and. Um, uh, I used to foster dogs for her, and um, it was really a great experience. And such a good feeling. Too. It, it's wonderful. Yeah, we, you know, too. some of my favorite fosters were through Rebecca's Rescues. I had a wolf dog named Genji. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, a blue tick hound named Bo, oh, and uh, just all these wonderful animals that were. I was so lucky to have come through my doors, and people always ask me, you know, like, is it hard? Is it hard? How do you do it? I don't know how you do it. And, it is. It's hard. It's hard to give them up. It's hard to have an animal come into your house that's broken and have to know that you're putting them back together. But we've had such wonderful experiences with our fosters, um, and it's really been amazing. And then Poor Paws, I started working with more recently. Um, they actually pull dogs up from Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, just a week ago, we had a, a foster named Mason, who unfortunately had to go to another foster home because my taco was being a grump. Mason was great, but my taco was being a grump to him. He's a 12-year-old lab mix, so he gets a little moody. Um, but he was in a kill cage in South Carolina, and the, the shelter called and was like, there's not a single red flag on this dog. He's wonderful. He's beautiful. He's got a great disposition. He's a year old. Like, please don't let this happen. So they posted on the, the site. I said I would take him. We pulled him up, and he was such a love, you know, rode with his head on my shoulder the whole ride back from picking him up off transport. And uh, it is, it's just such a wonderful feeling. And I, I encourage people to get involved. I think a lot of people have um, a lot of doubts about their ability to foster, or what makes a good foster home, or I don't have the time, or I'm not home often enough, or I'm not this, or I'm not that, or what if I have to create them all day? And you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if you don't step in to help out these animals, they're sitting in a crate all day anyway, mm -hmm. in a, a facility with a hundred other barking dogs. and. You know, any yeah, anything you can provide for them is a step up from where they are now. I'll make sure that uh, we leave links down below to each of Absolutely, these. Absolutely, yeah. They they both accept donations via PayPal. They both have their own websites, um, Rebecca's Rescues dot org and Fourpaws Rescue dot org, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful way to get involved if you want to foster you can help with volunteer events if you're not a foster you can just show up and help which is how i initially started because i was still living at home with my parents so fostering wasn't an option and i would go to the volunteer events and i the first job i was ever given was to man the kitten tent which is literally just sitting in a tent full of kittens <laughs> and wow. so I'm, yeah. not, I'm not sure why any more. Yeah. <laughs> so and then it became, you know, it evolved into I fostered my own kitten, so I had my own kitten tent, and then I had, you know, puppies and Easter. My friend, my um, brother's girlfriend's mother. We went to her house for Easter, and she was, you know, invited us and wanted us to come. I said, I'm so sorry, I don't think we're going to be able to make it. We have two six-week-old fosters, and she said, bring them. So I said, are you, are you sure? And she said, yes, bring them. And so Easter, 
I have these wonderful pictures of my husband and his brother passed out on the couch from eating too much with both puppies like curled up on their chests. And you know, it, it, you make it work. It's not a perfect system, but it's a wonderful thing to get involved in. I highly recommend it for anyone. I would have read this and I never would have questioned anything. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, okay, stuck on math, stuck on this, needs this many potatoes, got it, whatever. Yeah, it but like, you know that it had such a strong cult following because the first real scientist to pick this up was reading it, like looking for errors. And Hang like, on, yeah. Mm, <laughs> this checks out. And then like, was like yeah. passing it along and that's yeah. like, like, hey, did like, you read this book? The yeah, math's the real. Math is, the <laughs> math is, it, real. Yeah, it, it, it like built such a beautiful bridge between literature and science and math, which is so hard to do. And I think that if an established writer put this together, it would have been a completely different piece. Well, look at all oh, of the yeah. Like, I'm going to use this because this is a point of contention for me. The, like, the doctor shows out there today. Like, I can tell you, my mom's a nurse and watching those shows, I'm highly certain 90% of the time that, like, like Grey's Anatomy and stuff like that, nurses watching the show are there just to pick at yeah, it. Nitpick. To, to nitpick. Mm -hmm. you That's have, why I read Twilight. You have it's read Typos. Oh, God. That was, just, this is, uh, this is a completely she's different... different I'm I, gonna, I, read I would like I to finish like, all the wrong. But, but basically <laughs> what I'm saying is you have people in that profession watching these things that are created by individuals who have no knowledge or have right. basic knowledge of that. And so if you had someone like, if I decided to sit down and, and postulate what would happen, I don't have the, the basic anatomic chemical and mathematical knowledge right. of how you'd have to do so much research to produce right. half of and that. Because and the fact of the matter is like, most, you know, some authors wouldn't do that much and it would never, like you could do all the research in the world but you're never going to yeah, be an astrophysicist. So, but I would, I would yeah. have the, the humanity the aspect of it and it, the math part is what makes this movie, movie this book work so well is because yes. he had the in, ingrained knowledge of math and science Everything else came naturally, yes. and it would be flipped, and that would make it weighty Force. and forced. Yes. Yeah. So and the television and the film industries, though, they seem to have their own agendas that they need to fulfill in order to entertain people, and they're willing to break rules and technicalities when wasn't. it comes to. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. There was no agenda to this book besides this is a story of a man who's very mm -hmm. smart and very funny, and, and his will to survive. How do you guys feel about the title? I loved it. Loved it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it makes uh, sense yeah. because it, it puts a real twist to The Martian because one would think The Martian would be an, an extraterrestrial Can I just alien say, alien when yeah. I first heard of the movie, without even realizing it was a book, when I first heard the movie, I actually had no interest in watching it because I don't find... You know, aliens all that exciting. Space like everyone's scares the like, living daylight. Like, I'm not oh, gonna lie. I, just, I love no. space. I took an astronomy class in college. I loved it. I took a million more. Oh, it I was took so an fascinating. Class. Uh, like, Jackie uh, <laughs> can tell you that it was. It's a lot. It's it, a it lot. Was, and honestly, I found the class to be a little depressing only because of how small it made me feel. But at the same time, I did find it very fascinating. So when I heard that The Martian, I was like, oh no, aliens, somebody stranded on Mars. Now they're going to try to kill him and he has to live through aliens. Right. And so I ended up accidentally watching it with my dad. I came home from work. My dad had just started the movie and I'm standing and I'm watching it. I was like, Dad, what is this? And we're like, at 45 minutes in, I was like, this is a good movie. What is this? He goes, oh, it's that that, that Martian, the Martian movie. I was like, no. It took uh, such so, a, yeah, it, I think like, it was so clever. It took such a spin on people's preconceptions of an idea. And, you know, in many ways, Mark became, he was the Martian. He was the only living person to survive on this planet. And... That, for an extent, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what he was. He was the Martian. His character Which even is, like postulates that, and it's like looking at it. I never expected myself to be like on the list on that list of firsts. I'm the first person to cultivate like live or colonize. Like, I, colon, yeah. I colonized I it colonized with potatoes, <laughs> and I, I was the first person to live X amount of time on the the planet. And I think that's where it kind of that clicked. I was like, okay, I understand He's why he called himself the Martian because he had to create his own life. Um, did. It was life on Mars. Life on Mars. And yeah. what else would you call somebody who's living on Mars? Mm -hmm. Martian. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I, the the title and, is very fitting. And yeah. David Bowie kept like popping into my head yes. while I'm reading it. I'm like reading, <laughs> like singing Life on Mars. And my headphones. My husband's looking at me. And he chooses for his theme song, Staying Alive. Yeah, 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 I love yeah that was great. So good. But if. Uh, 
I wouldn't mind the seventies music, especially the ABBA music. I, I mean, that to be honest with, you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it for like an hour, and then I would start but going that's crazy. With any specific <laughs> subgenre, like it gets old. You gotta yeah. ration it. You gotta rotate what your means of entertainment. Absolutely. You yeah. do the Agatha Christie novels, and then you do the Grease <laughs> Company, the Sanford and Son, Absolutely. the ABBA music. That okay. poor man watching but, nothing but 70s Could you imagine stuff coming for, back like, and, like, having the shows out. on that are on now and being like, <laughs> what is What this? happened? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, it was, I think it was a wonderful book. It Moments, really was. Yeah. I, uh, I would recommend it. I, I think as much as this is a, you know, scientific, uh, you know, book, I think I felt like living kind of in his mind is also very psychological piece as well and I feel like you can take a lot from you know what he did and how he survived and how he kept himself entertained again I'll go back to my favorite part what is he thinking how can Aquaman talk to whales like (laughs) he dedicated a whole log to three sentences of how can he talk to whales and and I felt like you know it was a psychological thriller in that sort of sense like how to keep yourself sane living on a planet by yourself for a year and a half Yes, you have things to do, but you know, ultimately, when it comes down to it, you lay down at night, you're alone. Mm-hmm. I would say and that's, that's that. that, and when he when he posed as the Fonz yeah. is probably it, the funniest it, part. It, it, <laughs> and how yeah. bad the Andy girl got. Yeah. She's like the Fonz. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's one of those books when you I. Get, you got a picture. Here's your damn picture. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like, that's what you wanted. And how he even said, "Have you met Mark?" <laughs> like. <laughs> um, I, when I picked it up, and like I said, initially I was like, oh my god, this is going to be a slog of math and reasoning. And then it instantly turned into this book that had heart and had comedy and had such an optimistic view of human, of like the humankind, and of an individual who's going through these terrible, horrible things. Um, and I think that was the best part of it was how optimistic and hopefully, hopeful it was written. Um, so it's one of those books that I definitely say like, it's a good read. It's a quick read. It's an entertaining read. It reads like a book. It has beautiful um, juxtaposition of, and especially down to the part where they were talking about the canvas, how that mm-hmm. was thread, uh, threaded throughout, and then the big reveal of like the the uh, spoiler alert, the hub like blowing yes. up. Yes. The discussion. Like, it's subject to spoilers. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Spoiler alert. But um, <laughs> so like the way that it's presented is very entertaining and I was not expecting that and was happily surprised by how entertaining the book was. It's a good fun read. Even though you know you saw like for those of us who saw the movie even though I saw the movie I knew he was going to live I still got that anxiety which I feel like is when you yeah when you read a book after seeing a movie or already know what happens if you can still get that anxiety I feel like that's a good writer (laughs) and he really did because you don't know how it's going to be presented and you like you know the outcome and you know point A and point B, but you don't know the path there. And, and it's not a straight line. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's Especially not for him. It was no, all no physically mm-hmm. and it's metaphorically. Like, yeah, I know he's going to get to Schiaparelli Basin, but oh my god, now it's turned over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh it was, it was more of just like a, instead of what was going to happen, it was more of an unfolding how is this going to Yeah, how is it going to happen? And I was really, go- like, I was very invested in the how. Of this book, and the and Andy Weir makes it for you easy to become invested. Yes, and that was the fun part. Yeah, so definitely, a, I would give it a, a four on the scale of five. Oh, that's just what I was going to ask. Zero to five stars, half stars I, for me. Yeah, I would think four for me because uh, not my favorite genre. So it was a little struggly in the beginning for me. So if you know if you aren't that interested in science and math, it can be a little hump to get over when they're first laying out that foundation. Mm-hmm. But like we said, once that foundation is set, it it becomes a book. Like it's not a log, it's not a, a report on what happened. It's a mm-hmm. it's a novel of a man and his quest for survival. So mm-hmm. I think it's really beautiful. Jesse? Now I originally wanted to give it a four and a half. As I was reading through the book, I was like, oh this is definitely four and a half for me. Um, because I want to feel emotionally invested before I give something a five. Like I have, I have a criteria in my head. Um, it was in that, it was in that moment that I read, you know, the conversation between Johansson and her father. That was when I started to tear up and I started to cry. And that was that realization, oh my God, these are human beings making these decisions. That was the moment I was like, no, this book is a five for me. So I, I give it a five. I just, I loved the science. I loved the comic relief. I loved 
the frustration, even some of the curse words were okay with me. <laughs> like, it starts it out. All, like, yeah. Except for when it comes from Annie, um, because she does it all the time. Yeah, like I Which is really funny because she's supposed to be like the spokesperson. She's the face for NASA, and like she curses like a sailor, crazy. and it's and that's the way I mean, they. That's how it usually goes. Yeah, so. that, and that's what made it more real was the fact that this person is supposed to be you know, like glossy and put together, and behind the doors is f f f f f f. Like, because this is kind of an oh shit situation. Oh god, yeah, really? It's it's there's no nice in the sand in that way. Curse more, and I think that was another part that I liked about it was like, yeah, he cursed, he cursed a lot. He's like, well, I'm effed, and oh. And you know, like all this, and then he was like, "Okay, but no, it wasn't wait, keep ang- it wasn't do angry it. cursing though. It was and more like reason. exasperated. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think if disgusting. you're on, if you're knocking on death's door, uh, and you you're in you're a situation allowed, like, where allowed your <laughs> life is in physical yeah. jeopardy, you have a right to do that. I curse a lot just if I have a bad day. I curse mm-hmm. more when I stub my toe than this man probably did. On- the Mars. entire time yeah. on Mars, so, yeah. Every curse was apropos. <laughs> how many, uh, Not only that, and how, you know, I felt like uh, Andy Weir also was uh, successful in kind of dumbing down some of the science, too, yes. to make it understandable. And I, I felt like, overall, the book was just very enjoyable. He was funny, lighthearted, optimistic. Andy Weir did a great job writing it. I felt a connection. Like, I don't know, I really enjoyed it. So I, I'd definitely say five stars. I would agree, definitely, because I love science fiction, I, and I especially love, and this is going to sound stupid, I love my science fiction to have some actual science and some ha- like yes. actual <laughs> real groundwork in there, so to have this very human, very scientific-based book about a very improbable, kind of out-there wild scenario, like it made it all the more enjoyable for me. So I'm somebody who, if you give me, I don't even care how deeply rooted it is, if you give me some sort of science in my science fiction, I'll be like, okay, all right. I and accept this. So exactly, I'll accept it and move fiction, forward. Yeah. And because of so much of the, the, the heart and soul that is shown through these very dynamic characters that feel like you can sit next to them on the train or you'll pass yes. them on the street. Very, um, or it's like the person you want in NASA. Like, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, very rarely do you get a book where there's a doomsday day scenario and everybody who's supposed to be where they are are there and the situations are dire but turn out for the better like I love a good story ending and yeah maybe you know you have the whole um travel back to earth but I I love stories that have a happier ending and this gave that to me so I'm gonna a five star and I think it's only as I said before it's fiction on the fact that this is a fictional scenario and the characters are fiction but I think in order to be a five-star read, uh, you have to have uh, perfect pacing, uh, you have to have fleshed out characters, a fleshed out, or if anything, a fleshed out story that's going to stick with you uh, long beyond the book. Mm-hmm. And I think that this book has uh, all of the, I think that, yeah, it has all of it. Absolutely. It, the way that they uh, changed settings based off of whose perspective yeah. they were uh, telling uh, the point of view from is perfect. Sometimes that can't land. Sometimes it doesn't land appropriately, and I think they did this marvelously. I think it was handled wonderfully. That's why I gave this book uh, five stars. Can I add, like, one final comment that I remember thinking as I read the end of the book, just to, like, throw it in there? um, Like, one of the last pages, he's talking about, you know, if this were a movie, I would come back into the space station high fives and hugs all around. Um, no. And that and that didn't oh, happen. That was, but it like, made me laugh because and, like, in the movie, the that's actually yeah. what happens when he comes back into. And I, uh, I was like, did they actually? Yes, did they do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who did that? I can't remember. It's probably on. The, it's probably. I think they that's did the it. way Hollywood works. I hope but they did it on purpose. They better have because, because that and I love when a movie can. I love when a movie can like put like. Sometimes that movies, movies uh, up, yeah, yeah, wink for the book audience. audience. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. because you have to acknowledge, if you're turning a great novel into a movie, you have to acknowledge that it's a great novel. And I think that was their way of acknowledging it. Okay, because I was going to say, it just made me laugh because here he comes back and he's got he's talking about how he has a broken rib, but he comes back in and everybody's like, oh, it's like, you made it, you smell bad, okay, high five. Yeah, and it's like, here he's like, if this were a movie, that's what would have happened, but it didn't. I was rushed to the, and they took care of me, nobody touched me, and then everybody <laughs> came in. They like, broke the I think if that were my book, I would be pretty upset because <laughs> I would be a cap. I would be 
making mention to that for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mentioned for a reason yeah. because it's not this picture perfect Hollywood. Yeah. It's supposed to be real life. Again, lending mm -hmm. it. But I, to I that. do, I do think it was a oh, a fun way to allude to the book mm -hmm. because yeah. you can't like I, if of all the things in the book that I would be okay with them changing for the sake of Hollywood, that's probably yeah, the only thing. Yeah, I don't know. Make it a separate scene. That's probably the like only thing. That's hysterical. <laughs> I, I got a really good laugh out of that, yeah. and I wasn't sure like if anybody else kind of noticed it was that. <laughs> Alrighty then. If you're interested in checking out The Martian, uh, here's my copy. I got the uh, movie tie-in mass market paperback uh, as a birthday gift from my sister. And uh, uh, after having read it, uh, it was a great gift. Oh, really and Jesse has <laughs> yeah, the original uh, hardcover copy. From the library. 11 versus like 2014 or something to that. Right. Whenever the movie came yeah, out. Like, I need yeah, one yeah, 2014, like, really... whenever it came out. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I, I feel like it came out way, like, I can't believe it was four years ago. I gotta check something out. Do you have your Murakami glasses? I think you have to put them on. To make the depth perception correct. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Already. <laughs> and now Tori's the Martian. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Damon. A literary well, here. Sure be sure to, guest star. Already, be sure to join us next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. And for now, keep reading. Hey, thank you. <laughs>